live from the bird house we are into the month of february it's tuesday february 8th and today we're talking about the different winter birds that you can find here in your yard we also have a couple of announcements we've got some fun stuff going on here at the store including a new shop cat who you'll meet in just a moment um, we have a walk we haven't done a walk in a really long time a guided walk so we've got one of those coming up this Saturday with the Genesee Valley Audubon Society. And then we are also doing our first caption contest. We had a whole bunch of great photos sent in for our photography contest last year. We thought, how fun would it be to have a caption contest and some of the really great photos? And if you happen to win that, that caption contest, you get a $25 gift certificate to the store, to the birdhouse here. So I'll tell you all about that. And then also we will talk about what kind of birds you can find in the area. As always, we'd love to know who's on. You can just pop in and say hi or... Uh, you can ask us your questions and if you have any kind of sightings that you've had in your backyard or while you're out hiking please put those in the comments we love to know what kind of things you guys are seeing out there so definitely let us know so first i thought i would mention um we've been um getting some little chatter here and there from people on the live streams about meeting the new cat at the store. And yes, we do have a new cat. His name is Orion. A lot of you probably had met over time Star, who was our uh, other previous kitty who passed away in August. And so we took some time off from having a shop cat and, um, uh, just didn't feel the same around here. So we went to Lollipop and we found Orion and he, he went right for us. He's very, very friendly. He's four years old and he was taken off of the streets here of Rochester. So he has a nice home here now at the birdhouse. So you can pop in anytime and you can uh, meet Orion here. So he's a really good boy, four-year-old mail from lollipop farm so this is orion and he loves attention so um be sure next time you pop in to to, to look for orion here and he would absolutely appreciate that and then we have a bird walk coming up. So this is super exciting. We hope to do more of these this year. Um, every year pre-COVID, we would partner with Genesee Valley Audubon Society to do a walk in the woods around Valentine's Day. They call it their Valentine's Walk in the Woods. And that's going to be this Saturday. So um, Genesee Valley Audubon is asking that you do register for this event. And you can register by either emailing or calling Joni from the Genesee Valley Audubon Society and her information is there on the screen. Um, way is to just give her a call at 585-338-3712. And this walk will meet at Mendham Ponds at 9.30. And we will be live streaming from there, our usual Saturday broadcast. 10 o'clock, we'll start a live stream there um, in Mendham Ponds so we can do a live stream of what kind of birds we're seeing right there live. So that should be fun. So you can absolutely register for the, for that event there. If um, you don't have time to write it down during this live stream, we do have an event listed on our Facebook page. So you can go right on to our, the Birdhouse Facebook page and you can um, get all of the information you need to register. So some birds that we might see on Saturday at the bird walk. First of all, it's going to be the nuthatch. Here's a picture of, an, of a white-breasted nuthatch here on, um, on someone's hand. This is going to be a common sight Saturday. So at the, the walk, it's going to be of Birdsong Trail. And um, we'll go out there, we'll provide seed for you. And you can feed birds right out of your hand, which is really cool. And there's some usual suspects that you see most times when you go out there that will come right to your hand to feed. And those are going to be the chickadees, of course. And we hand out a special type of seed called our chickadee blend. And you'll notice when you're there, if you do go to either the guided walk on Saturday or if you go on your own, if you have something that has peanuts in it, the birds are going to go for the peanuts over anything else um, each time, including these little guys like the chickadees. Here's the white-breasted nuthatch. You can expect to see them coming right to your hand on Saturday. Even red-breasted nuthatch. So they're going to be a little bit smaller, 
more common here in the winter time and they've got that red breast they've got some streaking on their face so the red breasted nuthatches will also come to um, to your hand there at Mendham Ponds Park and then the titmouse so the titmouse is in the same family as the chickadee and this photo was sent in to us by bob h of a tufted titmouse it says if you don't have a heated bird bath you really must try one out so this is a picture of a tufted titmouse in his bird bath he's been having some good luck with um with birds coming to his bird bath including this tufted titmouse and here's a picture of another tufted titmouse that mark sent in from mendham pond so he was able to see some there and this, I love this picture here because it shows their behavior. So this is something that you can often see either in your yard or if you uh, do go to Men and Ponds to feed these birds out of your hand, they'll, they'll grab a seed or a peanut. They'll, they'll grab it in their beak, they'll fly away, and then they go to a branch, they'll tuck it between their feet, and then they'll peck away at it. So the tit mice tend to do that. So do the chickadees. So they're both known to do that. So hopefully we'll see some of that behavior um, on Saturday. So if you are interested in signing up, you can follow the contact information that's on the screen there. Either send an email to Joni from the Genesee Valley Audubon Society. Uh, either send her an email or shoot her a phone call. And so that is this Saturday, which is the 12th, and it starts at 930. So we hope to see you there. And then finally, our last announcement here is this is our caption contest going on. This was a picture sent in by Ben Barlow. He sent this in for our photo contest, which will start up again in September. And we're going to do this twice a month. So every first and third Sunday of the month, we'll post one photo and then uh, we'll do this on our Facebook page. So you can go, it's pinned right to the top of our Facebook page. You can see this photo and underneath you can put in a caption. At the end of the week, we will take the photo that has the most likes from the audience, and that person will win a $25 gift certificate to the birdhouse. So this is something brand new that we're just starting. It just went up on Sunday, so you still have some more time to participate. And of course, you'll want to go on the page and see um, and like your, your favorite comment. So this is the photo here. There's definitely... Uh, a lot of content there for you to come up with a fun caption. So if you enter, you just might win that $25 gift certificate. So there's been lots of great bird activity in the area and um, woodpeckers, everybody has been talking woodpeckers, that they're getting a whole bunch of them, especially coming to these paddle tail feeders. These are the feeders that have the little projection on the bottom. They're not just the, the small square cages, but they've got a little bit of extra and that is for the prop of the tail. So the larger woodpeckers like this red-bellied woodpecker, this photo that was sent in by Rich, um, those, those larger woodpeckers will use that tail prop to keep themselves upright. If you have cage feeder, sometimes they kind of flop around on it and it's hard for them to get their footing. So the paddle tail feeders like this are great for the larger woodpeckers like this red-bellied woodpecker that was sent in by Rich. And if you're lucky enough to get birds like the pileated woodpecker, the really big woodpecker, they absolutely love something like this. So this is in fact, um, Rich was kind of questioning, was this a red-bellied woodpecker? He put a question mark on it. Yes, this is a red-bellied woodpecker that you've got here. They're, they sometimes get confused with red-headed woodpeckers. People will call them red-headed woodpeckers. Because if you look at this male here, this is a, a male red-bellied woodpecker. They've got a lot of red on their heads. We do here in upstate New York, we've got a bird called the red-headed woodpecker, but they have a completely red head. Their whole head is red and they're not going to be very common anymore coming to feeders. So this is your red-bellied woodpecker and the males do have more red on them than the females. So you might see a female, she's going to be lacking some red between her bill and the top of her head. It's going to be more of a grayish color. That's still a red-bellied woodpecker. That's just a female. So here you can see the red really well. The red on the male will go from the tip of the bill all the way to the back of their head. And if you're lucky enough, sometimes you can actually see that little tinge of red that they have on their belly. So um, we've got some red belly woodpecker photos sent in by both Rich and then Mark saw some too over at Lock 32. So this is another male. You can see that red going from 
the top of its head all the way to the back of its neck. And you can kind of see the red belly here in the photo, the very, very small tinge of red there on the belly of this woodpecker. So this is the red-bellied woodpecker, very common in backyards right now. Here you can see the, the red belly a little bit better. Um, this red-bellied woodpecker found a snack. So found probably something that had been stored away, that it had cached away for the winter. We've been getting lots of snow, so it's harder for them to find some uh, natural food sources. So they're going to their caches that they've been working on over the spring and summer months. So this is a red-bellied woodpecker. I just found a little treat and is enjoying that. So now here's the pileated woodpecker, and this was sent in by, by Mark J. And this was a pileated woodpecker also seen at Menden Ponds Park. So um, we're excited to hopefully get a good diversity of birds on Saturday. So if you do come out, uh, make sure to bring your binoculars. If you've got a camera, bring your camera. And definitely dress for the weather too, because who knows what it could be like. And here's another um, picture of a red belly, or excuse me, of a pileated woodpecker, which was sent in by Gina. And she says, I often spot a pileated woodpecker on wooden trail, wooded trail walks and my yard. This was the first time I got a glimpse of its tongue. And I love this picture because you can see that it's got um, its tongue sticking out there, uh, probably going after some kind of insect larva in the tree. And next Tuesday, we'll talk more about woodpeckers. They're biology, um, the, the differences between all the males and the females, because you can tell the differences um, between many of these species that we have here. You can tell if they're a male or female. And even some of the signs that they leave are different, like the pileated woodpecker will leave these large rectangular holes in trees, whereas most of our other species will just leave circular holes. So we'll show you some of the different tracks and signs of the different woodpeckers we have in the area, including that really crazy long tongue that actually goes up into their skull and wraps around their head. So really amazing birds. And we'll take a more of a deep dive into woodpeckers next Tuesday. And then another type of woodpecker that a lot of people, myself included, have been getting at their feeders over the past couple of weeks are this species, which is the northern flicker. So this is going to be about the same size as that red-bellied woodpecker. The red-bellied woodpecker has more of black and white stripes across its back. The flicker is going to be more brown and it has all these polka dots on it. So it's a really, really pretty bird. When it flies away, you see a wash of yellow from underneath its wings. So lots of people getting northern flickers at their feeders. I think this is the first year I've ever had them coming to my feeders. And um, it, it started once we started getting all that snow. So I'm curious if you guys are also getting um, any kind of different visitors to your yard or to your to your feeders here. So let us know um, what kind of things you're seeing. Here's another picture that was sent in by Bob of his heated bird bath. He had the tufted titmouse in it earlier. He says, if you don't have a heated bird bath, you really must try one out. And here are all of the bluebirds. So people have been getting bluebirds if you're lucky enough to get them. They can be tough to get in general. Um, but if you are lucky in your yard in the spring and summertime, you might be able to attract them in the winter with something like this. Um, they're not going to be your typical bird that comes to a bird feeder. They eat a lot of insects. So in the wintertime, they tend to switch more to a, a diet of berries. They'll come to suet feeders though. They'll eat the, the, the logs that we talk about, those bugs, nuts, and fruit logs. They'll eat those as well. Um, but people seem to have the most luck with bluebirds when they have a heated bird bath in the winter. And keep in mind, bluebirds do like a very specific habitat. So they like wide open spaces, things with, um, you know, think of big fields, wildflower meadows, farm fields. Those are perfect, uh, perfect types of habitat for bluebirds. So if you don't have that kind of habitat, if you've got a lot of trees or woods around you, they can be hard to attract. And then here's a picture sent in again of the heated bird bath in Bob's yard. Here is a male cardinal. Um, going to that bird bath. So you'll get all kinds of different birds going to those to those bird baths. Not every bird will come to a feeder, but they all do need some kind of water. And this is a lovely photo sent in by Gina Kay. She says, a male cardinal that was perched in my backyard with the afternoon sun bringing out its best. 
And if you are outside listening at all, you can probably hear those cardinals start to sing. That's been the bird I've heard singing the most over the past few weeks. They, they're, they're not really singing their full songs, but they'll start kind of practicing their songs for the spring. Um, it's called singing sub songs. So you might hear a little portion of the song, then it kind of drops out. That's pretty common this time of the year. So they're just starting to sing. So in the morning, if, if you have your ear, um, ear out to the outdoors, you might just start to hear these cardinals start to sing. I've been hearing them for the past couple of weeks, which is really cool. Um, and here's another photo of a cardinal. Here's the female cardinal, uh, beautiful female cardinal here in the snow, and we have plenty of it here. Um, I'm an American tree sparrow, so this is going to be a species that we don't have here in upstate New York in the spring and summertime. This is going to be one of our winter species, and this was a photo taken by Mark J at Menden Ponds Park, and the tree sparrow here, it's got that chestnut cap on the top of its head. If you're familiar with, say, chipping sparrows that we do get in the spring and summertime, this tree sparrow is going to be much bigger than the chipping sparrow um, than, than it is. And you're not going to see chipping sparrows around here this time of the year. That's going to be come migration time. So if you see a sparrow like this with the chestnut cap, it's probably going to be a tree sparrow. So keep your eyes out for them. And then Sally sent in this picture of a brown-headed cowbird at her feeder. So several of you guys have talked about them being in, in your yards. This was a mystery bird for her. She wasn't quite sure what it was because it doesn't have that brown head and kind of bluish, blackish, iridescent body right now. Probably a juvenile. Um, but yeah, people have been getting brown-headed cowbirds coming to their feeders and they'll eat sunflower hearts, sunflower seeds. Um, so keep an eye out. You might just be getting some brown-headed cowbirds. Not a super typical backyard bird, but also not terribly uncommon, especially with food being scarce with all of the snow cover we have at the in the ground right now. And Richard also had a group of brown-headed cowbirds coming to his feeder here. So they are definitely been around, been, been sighted around. Blue jays, another common backyard bird. Best way to attract them right now in the winter is peanuts. They love peanuts in the shell. They love the little pickouts, what are called peanut pickouts. The insides of the, of the bird or of the, of the peanut, the peanut pickouts are great for blue jays. Their favorite though seems to be peanuts in the shell. So if you put those out, that will make the Blue Jays very happy. Last week we were talking about finches and some of the differences between them. So I thought I'd show you guys some that tend to get a little bit confused. Um, house finches, purple finches, pine siskins, common red poles, a lot of them, um, a lot of them can kind of look pretty similar. So I thought I'd show you, uh, we could compare some of the, 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 similarities and the differences between them. So here you've got your house finch and this is going to be a pretty common bird year round here at feeders. You, uh, you can find the house finches not only on the east coast but on the west coast as well. In fact that's where they originated from was going to is the west coast. The male house finch has a red on it. Sometimes Sometimes they look even redder than this picture. Sometimes they're a little bit more dull. So there could be some crossover there. But the male house finch, a pretty good amount of striping. So if you look at its body here, it does have a lot of stripes that go down its body. And that's not going to be the case in the purple finch, which we'll see next. Now the female house finch is just kind of a nondescript bird. She is um, she's very brownish with the same stripes, but she doesn't have any kind of red on her body. Now the purple finch, which is going to be at more of a common bird here in the winter, is going to be slightly larger than the house finch. Their bill is also more robust too. If you look at the difference here between, here's your house finch again, and the purple finch, the purple finch does have a bigger bill. So that means they might be even seen at coming to, to seeds that the house finches don't really go to. So if you have something like striped sunflower, which is the larger sunflower seed, probably won't get house finches coming to that so much, but you might get the purple finches because they do have that bigger robust bill. So this is the purple finch male. It's going to be 
like its name suggests, more of a purple raspberry color than the house finch. And it also is lacking those stripes that go down its breast and along its side. So here you've got your male house finch. He's got lots of, a lot of stripes on him. And then the purple finch isn't going to have that. The female purple finch almost looks like an overgrown sparrow. She's got a pretty distinctive eye, uh, stripe above her eye. So that's another way to identify her if you're trying to compare her, uh, the, the purple finch female to the house finch female, and she's going to be larger as well. So that's the female purple finch. And then there was a question about red poles last week. Last year, we had an eruption year of red poles. So we have lots of red poles in the area. This year, not so much. Um, there's there's really haven't been many sighted at all. But this is what your red pole looks like. So if we're kind of comparing, they all look kind of similar. They're not they're not too uh, too distinctly different from one another. But the red pole is going to be a smaller bird. So think more chickety size than uh, say your purple finch. And then the red pole have a little dot right on the top of their head. So they've got this raspberry red colored dot that's right on the top of their head. Your red poles, if they do come to your feeders, they're, they're going to tend to come to your Niger feeders. Whereas your house finches, they'll eat Niger, but they tend to more like the sunflower seed, safflower seed. And same with the purple finch. They tend to like the sunflower and safflower seed. So the food that they're eating could make a difference too. Now, just to complicate things a little bit further, here we've got the pine siskin. And pine siskin is another kind of brownish, stripy colored bird, but you're likely to see them in the winter coming to Niger feeders as well. So they have stripes on their body. Look at their beak though, they've got a very sharp bill. So that's one distinctive characteristic. And they've got more yellow on them than any of these other birds are going to have. Even your goldfinches that will have some yellow on them aren't going to have these stripes on them like the pine siskin would. So if we're comparing some of our winter finches and birds you might see at your feeder, you've got your house finch, uh, which are here year round. Males have red on them. They're quite striped, both males and females. The purple finch, males are really lacking those stripes. They're more of a raspberry color. They're larger in size. Um, the female purple finch has that eye stripe, the, the stripe that's going over her eye that's quite distinctive. Your common red pole has that raspberry dot on the top of its head. Probably not going to see them this year if you're, if you're further north than upstate New York you're in a different situation. You might be having them coming to, to your feeders right now. But here we're in the Rochester area. We're really not seeing too many of those. But you just might get a pine siskin at your Niger feeder. Sharp bill, very straight body. They have lots of yellow on their wings. They're also known to feed off the side of the road. They tend to, to feed on road salt here and there. So as things start to melt here, if you see a little flock of stripy birds at the side of the road, might very well be some pine siskin. So, and then I thought I would, uh, these are some other birds that sometimes get uh, mistaken for one another. Here's a picture of a European starling sent in by Mark. It's going, it was eating some berries there. So European starlings are here all year round. They don't migrate. So this is a bird common, at least in my backyard. And I know in a lot of your backyards, it comes up often. How do I keep starlings at bay? Um, so this is your typical starling. Right now, they tend not to have as much iridescence on them. They're going to be more black colored with white dots on them. They might still have the yellowish bill, but it could also be a grayish color. Um, so here's your European starling. This grackle. So this is a grackle. This is a common grackle. Now here in New York, we don't really have grackles here at the moment. They're, they tend to go south for the winter. So where as you might have a stray lone grackle here and there, they're really not here right now. So grackles are going to be larger than the starlings. They don't have the same patterning either. So they're going to um, not have those polka dots on their body, but they've got that iridescent blue head and they have a blackish, sometimes it looks iridescent body. We'll start to see those probably in about a month, a little bit more than a month or so, 
once migration starts, blackbirds tend to be some of the first birds that come back. So you'll see mixed flocks of grackles and red-winged blackbirds. But right now, you probably don't have grackles at your feeders. You probably have these guys, the European starlings. So um, really common bird, and they'll eat just about everything besides safflower seed. So that, that is your European starling. There's your grackle. And then we do have crows. We have crows, we have ravens, both around here. Crows aren't going to be a typical backyard bird though. You might get them in your backyard, um, but they really don't come to feeders too, too often. Uh, but you never know, you just might get them maybe coming underneath your feeders to feed. They're going to be quite, quite large and they're not going to have the patterning on them that the starling does. And they aren't going to have that iridescent blue head that the grackle does. So we have American crow here. Um, we do have something called a fish crow, which is a little bit smaller than your typical American crow. And then we also have ravens, which are larger than the crow. So we've got a few different types of birds in that family here in the area. So I thought I would just show those too, because um, sometimes those get a little mixed up as well. Carolina wrens, people are, are still reporting. They're another bird that you might start to hear singing. Um, here's a picture of Carolina wren sent in by Bob, who actually had a couple in his backyard, which is really neat. They, uh, we've been getting reports of them coming to suet feeders, and they love these log, uh, these seed logs like this that have um, a whole bunch of different types of seeds in them. And the bugs, nuts, and fruit log is the one that is really bringing them in because it has the sunflower hearts in it that they like and it also has mealworms freeze-dried mealworms which the wrens will eat all year round this is another food here that the bluebirds are coming to so um, it can get a really good diversity of birds if there's a bird that will come to a bird feeder there's something in this bugs nuts and fruit log for them so there's basically something in this log for any kind of bird that will come to a bird feeder. So that's why it's been popular. And I like to show this photo too that was sent in by Ed. Um, this is a towhee, an Eastern towhee. And a few people have been spotting these guys too. So keep an eye out under your feeders. The towhees are in the sparrow family, but they're going to be larger than your typical house sparrow. Um, they've got a brownish colored sometimes black back depending if it's a male or female and then they have this chestnut wash on their side so really cool bird that was spotted by ed of course we'd love to share this photo here that was sent in by gina she says a fox that chose to sun itself on my driveway and then uh, if you're if you're going out birding these aren't going to be birds you'll typically see in your backyard, depending on your backyard. Um, but right now, long-tailed ducks, if you can find some open water, which now that things are warming up a little bit, um, you can probably find a little bit more open water. Look for these long-tailed ducks. Um, really, really gorgeous duck that's down here for the winter time. This is south for them for the winter. So if you find any kind of large open bodies of water, probably have some luck seeing some long-tailed duck. Common merganser. Here's the common merganser couple. This is a male and female. The male is on the left here. Another common waterfowl species that you can find here in the winter time. And then we also have a bird called a red-breasted merganser, which looks pretty similar to that female common merganser. Um, but if you're able to get a close-up on it enough, the red-breasted merganser will have a red eye, so that's a really great disting, uh, distinguishing characteristic there of that bird. Uh, another merganser, hooded merganser, love this bird, smaller size duck that you can find by open water. This photo was sent in by Karen. And there's several other species of, of ducks, so if you can find those open bodies of water, now's a great time to go looking. Greater scalp, Mute swan. We have lots of mute swan on open areas. Look for birds of prey. Also, people have been reporting many different types of birds of prey, and we'll end with those. This American kestrel, 
uh, Gina spotted. Not going to be your most common type of bird of prey in this area in the winter time, um, but Gina was lucky enough to spot one, probably going after some small mammals. It was sitting on an electric line. She says, Kestrel on an old corn stalk out in the Avon area. It came down off an electric line to hunt. So if you're driving down any kind of country roads and you're looking at the phone lines, if you see something that looks like a morning dove, but it's got kind of a chunkier head, could very well be an American Kestrel. They tend to perch on power lines like that and oversee a territory in order to hunt. So keep an eye out for them. And eagles, the eagles people have been reporting have been wonderful. Any, just like those long-tailed ducks, any open bodies of water right now, keep an eye to the sky for bald eagles. Here's a juvenile bald eagle on Lake Ontario sent in by Mark. I love this picture that Gina sent in. She says, I was driving along Lake Ontario Parkway and spotted this eagle in a tree. There was a pull-off and I was able to get some shots. I wasn't able to capture the incoming mature eagle that decided it wanted that tree. The reason this one took a defensive pose. The mature eagle came out victorious. This one took flight after a bit of a protest. So juvenile eagles and adult eagles. If you see a really large bird of prey, but it doesn't have a white head or white tail, could very well be a juvenile bald eagle. The only other thing um, as far as a as far as a bird of prey that you'll see out in the daytime that's going to be about that size would be a turkey vulture. But they're, again, just like a lot of these other birds we've been talking about, they're going to be a little bit further south for the winter. So the odds of you seeing a turkey vulture right now aren't very strong. So um, keep your eye out for, for bald eagles. They don't get that adult plumage until they're about four years old or so. So it takes them a while to get that bright white head and tail. And the backyard report, as far as birds of prey goes, it's going to be your usual suspects, the sharp-shinned hawk and the cooper's hawk. And a lot of you guys have been reporting those. Um, the, the cooper's hawk is going to be the most common bird of prey you'll find in your backyard this time of the year. And they're very, they're, they're definitely known to go after songbirds. Here's a picture sent in by Anne of a cooper's hawk that went after a starling in her backyard. So Cooper's hawk ended up victorious over the starling. Really common this time of the year. There's not much you can do to keep them away, just like your bird feeders will attract different songbirds and it's easy food for them. Uh, those, those birds that come to feeders are easy food for some of these birds of prey. So if you're trying to reduce the number of birds of prey that you have in your neighborhood, the best thing you can do is take your feeders down for a few days. The hawks tend to go elsewhere and then you can put your feeders back up. Red-tailed hawks, absolutely have red-tailed hawks. They're common here year round. They have that nice red tail, although the juveniles don't, uh, don't have that tail right away, but you can tell it's a red-tailed hawk by these um, markings. They call them their dirty armpits there. Um, on that red-tailed hawk. So keep your eye out on the sky for red-tailed hawks. But if you see something that looks about the size of a red-tailed hawk, but a little bit different, doesn't have that red tail, it's pretty light in color, it could be a rough-legged hawk. They're down here for uh, for the winter. This is nice and, and warm and southerly for them. Um, they, they have different color morphs, so they can be um, so they can look a little bit different than this. Um, but they will have that dark belly. Um, that's that's uh, one of the color morphs is very dark belly. And then they have these dark colored wrist patches as well. So they're about the size of the red-tailed hawk. Um, so if you see something that looks similar in size to that kind of bird, um, but it's lighter in color, it could very well be a rough-legged hawk. So here's a picture of one perched. So some really neat diversity going on right about now. Um, we will answer your questions. If you have any kinds of questions, absolutely, you can put those in the comments. And I'll remind you guys too, if you're interested in signing up for the walk this, uh, this Saturday at Menden Ponds Park, feel free to call or email Joni from the Genesee Valley Audubon Society. We'd love to have you come out. It should be a fun time. Make sure to dress for the weather because who knows uh, what the weather will be like come Saturday. And let's see. So a dog named Boo. Um, Boo says, I get a variety of woodpeckers to my suet feeders. All you have mentioned, as well as Harry Downey and 
So Boo gets a nice diversity of woodpeckers um, at their feeder. And uh, we get the same ones right here, uh, right here in upstate New York. She said they all visit daily, such beautiful birds. I get a ton of bluebirds here. I'm in Northeast Ohio. All right, well, welcome to the live stream, a dog named Boo. Um, see, Bryce says, where to get a heated bird bath? We sell them here at the birdhouse. Um, if you're not local to the upstate New York area, you can visit our website, which is thebirdhouseny.com. And uh, we do have some to choose from on there and we, had some people sending in their photos here of birds that were visiting their bird baths, including the stuffed titmouse, um, cardinals, bluebirds. So you can get a pretty good diversity of birds uh, coming to a heated bird bath. Some people do even get birds of prey, get squirrels coming to it. Sometimes people get fox and all kinds of different critters coming to their heated bird baths. Uh, Bob says, thanks for going over the purple finch last week. I was able to go over some older photos and update their description. Oh, perfect. So yeah, one of the birds that people do report here in the winter is going to be the purple finch and um, they can be mistaken sometimes for the house finch. So we like to compare and show the differences between, uh, between all of them. Brenda says, I had bluebirds at my heated bath the other day. All right. So Brenda is another person who's lucky enough to get bluebirds coming to her heated bird bath. So that's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Um, let's see. Bad Campus says, that's a beautiful sparrow. We were showing uh, tree sparrows earlier. Um, Boo answered Bray's question saying you can buy heated bird baths at exclusive bird feed stores, which I think we would... Um, we we would be considered and let's see um ship says i'm trying to put out food that house sparrows don't like so that's um that can be a tough one so there's house sparrows which are going to be these um more stripy birds here there's also house uh, or there's there's house finches um which are these stripy birds but then there's house sparrows which are going to be another bird that um, people can find difficult in their backyards. They're really brown. They've got the, the males have the black patch on their face and they can come in large, large, large numbers and eat a lot. Um, there's not too much that they don't like. They tend to not like the safflower seeds so much. And birds like these house finches do like the safflower seed, um, but they will eat it. If it's their only option, they will eat the safflower seed. They tend not to go after the striped sunflower seed which is the larger sunflower seed it's not your typical black oil sunflower seed it's um it's it's much larger and and striped it's like the stuff you would um you'd get at the baseball game it's that kind of seed it's just large enough that it can be hard for the sparrows and for birds like pigeons to open up with their beaks so that, that could be something you do there's also niger feeders called upside down feeders where the perches are above the feeding ports. So in order to eat from them, the birds actually have to tip over upside down. And house finches have, or excuse me, house sparrows have a difficult time doing that. But um, the birds like goldfinches can do it, chickadees can do it. So that's another way to help kind of keep sparrows out of your feeders. It can be really difficult. Um, that's based, That's the majority of the birds that I get all the time are sparrows and starlings um, all the time. Um, Ed says, big news for us last week was that we've had two Carolina runs at our feeders for months now, but last week had a third Carolina run showed up. This one seemed a bit aggressive driving one of the other Carolina runs off the heated bird bath. Haven't seen them together again since, so they might have scared it away. Could have been maybe a rival male coming into the territory. So Ed has been getting Carolina runs as well. So really cool sightings. Those are always a fun bird to see at the feeders. And I love this photo that was sent in by Bob of this, this posture right here is like that typical wren posture where the birds all fluffed up and they've got their tails sticking up in the air. So really neat sighting um, there from Ed. Um, Bob says, I had a single red-winged blackbird mixed in with a flock of starlings. Okay, so we were talking about different blackbirds and flocks of blackbirds. Um, and right now, you're the most common blackbirds, um, even though 
starlings aren't in the blackbird family. They're often grouped together because they look similar. Um, the most common blackbirds you'll have in your backyard right now are going to be the star. But uh, like we saw earlier, there's people that have brown-headed cowbirds right now. And Bob even had a red-winged blackbird mixed in with his flock of starlings. So that's a really neat sighting there too. So awesome. Awesome sighting there. Let's see. Oh, Ed says, congrats to Orion. What a lucky boy to have landed such a great job with all kinds of benefits. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Orion is our newest um, member here of the staff at the birdhouse, and he is fitting in nicely here. So come in and, and meet Orion. Uh, he's, he's a pretty good boy as far as uh, pets go. So, uh, um, Ship says, good job, Cooper's Hawk. The Cooper's Hawk went after the, the starling. We get that question all the time, too. Is, is there a way that we can get the hawks to go after just the birds I, I don't want at my feeders? Um, if there is, I don't know of it yet. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a lot of people have been reporting Cooper's Hawks in their backyards. Here's a Cooper's Hawk that went after a starling. But, of course, they're, they're known to go after all kinds of birds morning doves, cardinals, um, blue jays, woodpeckers are all common prey items for uh, different hawks. Um, Boo says red-shouldered hawks are plentiful here. So um, Boo in Ohio has red-shouldered hawks and we get those here too in upstate New York. We tend to get them more of a migratory species so they don't hang out here too much. But come spring, we have a huge hawk migration that flies over the area, over in the Braddock Bay area, and that includes red-shouldered hawks. If you go further south, you'll see more red-shouldered hawks as well. Um, they're they're definitely um, they're definitely around the, the southern part of the U.S. as well. Um, let's see. Cindy says beautiful photos. Um, Boo says European starlings seem to mob the feeders in my yard. Same same thing here. European starlings can be tough because they do eat just about anything. Um, one seed that I've brought up several times in this, this broadcast here has been safflower seed, and they tend not to like safflower seed. Um, the sparrows tend not to like it so much either, but the sparrows will still eat it if that's their only option. Starlings, though, I really don't get starlings eating my safflower seeds. So that could be something for you to try. There's also different upside down feeders that you can get for starlings, just like that seed feeder I was talking about for Niger seed that keeps house sparrows out. Um, you can get feeders like that for suet to keep starlings out. So there's some different things you can do to try to discourage the starlings. Richard says, I've also seen a wren, which seems to look like a Caroline wren, and perhaps that's that's um, what you all have been talking about. Yes, that probably is. Right now, if you've got a wren in your backyard, it's probably a Carolina wren. Um, although we do have winter wrens here, there's marsh wrens, there's house wrens. You're probably most likely to be getting a Carolina wren though right now because they're going to be the ones that come to feeders most often. House wrens will nest in houses. So if you've got little hanging wren houses out come springtime, you might get them nesting. If you're by water, you might see the marsh wrens and um, you might just see winter wrens too bopping around if you're um, if you're out hiking. So there are some different types of wrens that you can see here in the area, which is always fun. Um, Deborah says, one of my super friendly squirrels likes my flaming hot feast cylinder. Guess he likes spicy. I guess so. We have different um, seed cylinders. I was showing you guys the bugs, nuts, and fruit one, which is really popular, which is here. Uh, but there's also a spicy one called flaming hot feast. And I actually think this is a picture of it here that the Carolina wren is eating. And it's covered in hot sauce. And the idea is squirrels can taste that hot sauce. They they don't really uh, like it in general, um, but they can taste it. Birds can't taste the hot sauce. Mammals just have more taste buds than the birds do. And so the squirrels in general will eat that flaming hot feast. They don't like the hot sauce on it and then they'll go elsewhere and the birds will just hungrily and happily eat that sauce, uh, the, the seed that's been treated with the sauce. So the flaming hot feast logs are made to keep squirrels out but Deborah has a squirrel that is not following the rules that likes the uh, that likes the the flaming hot feast, and I I have that happen to me every once in a while. I get you know a starling that will be eating safflower seed, or I get a squirrel that's taking a nibble of the of the flaming hot feast log. Thankfully, it tends not to 
last very long though. They'll be there for a couple of minutes and then they tend to go elsewhere. So um, hopefully you don't get mobbed too much by the squirrel um, liking your flaming hot feast log. She says, I've had great luck with it generally. So I'm glad to hear that at least in, in general, it's working. There's always, there's always some animal Play by the rules. So uh, Boo says, I just bought safflower yesterday. Good to hear the starlings don't like it. Yeah, they tend not to. So keep us posted about that. So that is everything we have for you guys today. Keep in mind, you can join us on this walk on Saturday. It's going to be it can be as short or as long as you'd like for it to be, depending on the weather. It tends to vary. We'll be on Birdsong trail for probably about 20 minutes, half an hour feeding the birds. And then if it's nice enough and you want to continue on the walk, the Audubon Society will lead a walk through um, through the woods for a little bit. So hopefully it'll be a nice day for a walk. Remember that registration is requested and required. So that is being handled through the, uh, the Genesee Valley Audubon Society. And you can call Joni at 585 338-3712 to reserve your spot. So we will be broadcasting live though. If you're unable to make it, we'll be broadcasting live from the trail for a little bit. Hopefully we'll have some good things to broadcast and to show you. Um, either way, we'll be back on Tuesday with another live broadcast and we're going to be talking woodpeckers. So that should be fun. We will see you then. And until then, have a great week and enjoy your birds. Bye-bye.